and Richard commissioned England's greatest surviving Gothic painting, the Wilton Diptych, an altarpiece that features the king with the infant Christ and Virgin Mary. The company of angels surrounding Mary defer to him, each wearing his personal emblem of the white heart. It's one of the most exalted images ever made of an English king, on an altarpiece. Gothic art was becoming a means of personal communion with God, even if you weren't a cleric. An exquisite manuscript from the 1420s shows this vividly. I'm at the British Library with a facsimile copy of the incredible Bedford Book of Hours. And it records an important event, the marriage of Henry V's brother, John, Duke of Bedford, to Anne of Burgundy. A Book of Hours was designed to be used and read by the noble patrons. It allowed them to emulate the cycle of prayers that monks followed. But unlike a community of monks, the readers of this volume could use it for private devotion. When you look at this image of Anne, we can see this emphasis on personal piety. She is in direct communion with the Virgin and Child. It's also interesting that at this time of a newly confident English court, the setting of heaven is surrounded by Gothic architecture. And when we come to the portrait of John, you can see that he is also in a private, personal communication, in this case, with the patron saint of England, St George. This object fascinates me because it brings together military commemoration, dynastic legacy and personal piety. These sacred and secular ideas are all expressed in one object. It really shows the heights that Gothic art had reached. The late genius of perpendicular meant that even small spaces achieved a feeling of elevation and light. And while architecture became ever more sophisticated, so the depiction of the human being became more rooted in reality. This is the Beecham Chapel in Warwick. And from the second you cross the threshold, you get the sense that this is an intact Gothic space. There's all of the elements represented here. You've got architecture, sculpture, metalwork, stained glass, painting. They're all working together in harmony to commemorate one man, Sir Richard Beecham. He was one of the most important military and political figures of the 15th century. He died in 1439 but it would take another 20 years for his vision to be realised and for the chapel to be completed. The central effigy of Sir Richard is the consummate Gothic figure, the formal image of a chivalric knight. At one level, a military man through and through, a career soldier who'd fought the Welsh and the French, but also a man of sensitivity and refinement. Sir Richard went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and was tutor to the infant King Henry VI. The effigy is life-sized. It's made of gilt metal, and that's a medium usually reserved just for royalty. The whole chapel cost an absolute fortune to make, £2,481. And this monument alone cost 720. I'll put that into perspective. Richard's family paid four monks to pray for his soul every day for a year, and they only got 40 pounds. But the monument's not just lavish and beautiful. It's also important artistically. The lifelikeness of the hands and the face anticipate developments that we see later in the Renaissance. If you look at the vein on the temple, it almost pulses with life blood.
There's a great sense of continuity and consistency in perpendicular Gothic that I find surprising because the 15th century is such a turbulent time. There's great political turmoil, but places like this keep getting put up. And their statements of permanence, stability, something lasting in a time of great change. As this chapel is being lovingly crafted, the wars of the roses are raging, and no one knows who's going to come out on top. Of course, the victor was the clever and scheming Henry Tudor. Shown here on the left, who, as Henry VII, founded a new royal dynasty that went on to give us Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Arguably a golden age in English history. It would also signal the end of the medieval age of Gothic. But not before one last flowering, possibly the most beautiful of them all. There is the magnificent rebuilding of St. George's Chapel at Windsor, home to the Order of the Garter. Then, the astounding perpendicular of King's College Chapel in Cambridge. The largest fan-vaulted ceiling in the world, likened to the art of lace-making. And of course, the Henry VII Chapel at Westminster Abbey, built in the first half of the 16th century. Few great art moments in history have dominated the fabric and sensibility of a nation for as long as Gothic. But Gothic architecture, which had put so much emphasis on structure and engineering, would begin to stray from its original integrity. For all its gravity-defying brilliance, the ceiling in the Henry VII Chapel departs from the previous genius of medieval masons. The fan-vaulted ceiling here is a masterpiece, but it is a flawed one. Traditionally, the fan would spring out of the top of the pier at the side of the wall, but here there are pendants set two metres in from the wall, and the fan appears to be springing out of those. Now, that's impossible. They're not supported by anything. It creates this gravity-defying illusion, but there's this arch that seems quite incongruous, breaking up the apsidal end from the nave. It really does upset the flow of the ceiling, it comes directly between two of the pendants. It seems it's here because while the building was being constructed, the masons had to almost make it up as they were going along. They must have felt that the ceiling needed additional support at that point. And if the ceiling above seems to signal the end of an era, so does the monument below. The impressive tomb of Henry VII and his queen, Elizabeth of York, is a significant departure from the Gothic. It was commissioned by Henry VII's son, Henry VIII, and made by the artist Torrigiano, who's credited as having brought the Renaissance style to the English for the first time. We can see that not just in the beautiful surface decoration and the figures around the tomb, but also in the details of the effigies of Henry VII and Elizabeth. This tomb heralds the dawning of a new era. Torrigiano's figures signaled a new age of realism. The figures of Henry and Elizabeth look domestic rather than chivalrous and courtly. The fluid movement in the fabric of their clothes replaces the straight and formal lines of Gothic sculpture. Cuddly cherubs sit alongside the more usual heraldic beasts. But the real blow to Gothic would come in the form of the English Reformation. 
Henry VIII made himself head of the church in England, overturning the authority of the Pope. It would herald an age of vandalism against Gothic art and sculpture, the language of the Catholic Church. Sacred paintings of saints would be scratched out, sculptures smashed. The great monastic institutions were abolished. Gothic architecture survived, but often ruinous and denuded of detail. And with a new reverence for the remains of ancient Rome, classical architecture, with its symmetry and sense of rigid proportion, would become fashionable. At the Palace of Hampton Court, Gothic fabric and classical detail even competed for the upper hand. Eventually, classicism would win out, dominating English culture for 300 years. The Gothic Age, above all the genius of perpendicular, England's first national style, seemed to be over. But it wasn't quite the end of the story. We tend to traditionally think of Gothic ending with Henry VIII. During his long and turbulent reign, the classically inspired Renaissance style that had grown up in Italy set down roots firmly in England. But history is fluid. There's rarely a moment where people unanimously wake up one day and think, oh, that's the end of one era and the beginning of another. There's always evolution and development. Gothic evolves and develops. True, events like the Reformation and the Enlightenment knock it off its pedestal as the defining architectural style of the high medieval period. But when Augustus Pugin and Charles Barry sought a new architecture of power and national pride for the Houses of Parliament, they returned to Gothic because English perpendicular Gothic was the physical setting for the birth of England as a nation.